welcome to part two of this special couple of programs, ladies and gentlemen, that we've been doing on what is known as the Stone of Destiny, the archaeological fact or relic, if you will, of the tribes of ancient Israel before they wound up in the Assyrian captivity. And this is the 10 northern tribes of the northern kingdom, because Israel divided and separated into warring factions, even against each other. The kings of Judah, the men of Judah, and the kings of Israel, the 10 northern tribes. That was done for a reason, that God allowed them to divide and to uh, actually to wage a war against each other until they both shall be reunited in the days just ahead when the millennium begins, when the real Jesus, Yeshua Messiah, returns to the earth in flaming fire. And he will take vengeance on those who are not obedient to him, nor know his gospel. The wicked, and particularly the city of Jerusalem, shall be conquered and leveled right to the ground, as it says in the scriptures, in a host of places, from the prophets of Jeremiah and Isaiah to the gospels of Matthew and Mark. There will not be one stone unturned upon another. Speaking of stones... The stone of destiny is the stone that was carried all the way to Europe. The stone which was seen to be Jacob's pillar, the resting place of Jacob, the ancient patriarch of the tribes of true Israel. They were known as the Jacobites. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated, God said. Now, why would God hate one and love the other in the womb while they were yet in Rebekah's womb, fighting each other, two little babies, two little children fighting each other? Well, it's because of the previous age in which this whole world existed, folks. If you don't understand the three world ages, the three heaven and earth ages, then it's not going to make sense to you. Why would God hate them? Why would God hate two little children or one and love the other? Why, why would he hate any child in the womb? Because there was a world and earth spoken of in Genesis chapter 1 in verse 2 and onward that existed before this earth age came about. It was known as the catabol, the destruction of Satan's reign on the earth. That is the overthrow of Satan's governance because this world existed, as you know, probably many eons ago. And let's not be silly here now. We don't believe in evolutionism. We don't believe in any such ridiculous theory that something came from nothing and that millions and billions and trillions of diversifications of all forms of life came from that nothing. Obviously, God created man. He created insects. He created the beasts of the field and all of the animal life that is here in the earth, plant life as well. Only God could do that. Nothing else could account for creation creation. Now you know why they kicked God out of the schools in America a long time ago. He had to go. God had to go in order that we would make room for what? The God of chaos and confusion, the God of Moloch, the God of Balaam, the God of humanism, and the goddesses of all of those things. You know, you can roll Easter eggs and you can bring them into the classroom and you can decorate them and call them whatever you want. As Link Chafee once said, just don't call them Christmas or Easter, you know, decorations. Well, they have nothing to do with Christ. Easter is a pagan holiday. As we read in the scriptures that God said in Leviticus, he said it again in Numbers, and he said it again in Deuteronomy, that I do not want you to worship other gods, pagan gods. Rolling Easter eggs is the god of fertility. Ishtar, that is not Jesus. His resurrection is the Passover, the Passover lamb. So in the previous age that was of this earth and heaven, that's why the Bible says heaven and earth shall pass away, but my never were. Well, how can heaven and earth pass away if we're going to be in the heavenly kingdom? And he says, you shall inherit the earth because there are three world ages. That's why the third one will come when Jesus returns. The first has already passed. Dinosaurs roamed the earth. There were tundra and all kinds of uh, buttercups that existed where Alaska is today. And we know that the buttercup, and we know that the tundra and all of that could not possibly have existed in the ice. But it did then. 
and the second age that God recreated and said to replenish the earth in the book of Genesis 1-2, that he would give new life, that he would give people a chance to start new. That is to start the earth and the populations over again. And then we read in the book of Genesis, uh, I believe it's chapter 6, he said that God then even regretted that he created the earth and its populations again. Why? Because man was out of control. Everybody was out of control. We saw what happened with Lot and Sodom and Sodomy and the twin cities that were destroyed, Sodom and Gomorrah, because of their homosexuality, because of their perversions, because of their lusts, and because of the fallen angels, the Nephilim, that were intermarrying with man, threatening to intermarry with the sons of Adam. That's why Noah had to build an ark, you see, to save that race, the race that God had created, known as Ethahadam, the man Adam, separate and apart from all the other races, indeed, we didn't all come from two people. God makes that clear in his word. Science validates that, obviously. But man doesn't want to listen. Preachers don't know the word of God. But God has shown us the word through his study, through the concordance, through understanding the meaning of words. So now we have part two of the Stone of Destiny in which Dr. E. Raymond Cabb, who was a scholar in his own right, the history of the Bible, and where did the northern tribes of Israel migrate to? And how did that stone of destiny go from the Mideast to Europe and stay there, and Scotland and in England and those places in Europe, those nations that now retain the crown and the seat and the chair and the stone of destiny? Who are these tribes? Are they the Jews today? No, they are not. Sit back, roll back, and record the following program as you hopefully did part one. And now, Dr. E. Raymond Cap, and this will conclude today's program at the very end. In seeing the film, Stone of Destiny, one cannot fail to be struck with the similarities between the coronation of Britain's monarchs and that of the kings of Israel's House of David. And all the regalia used in Britain's coronation ceremonies have biblical significance. It cannot be pure coincidence that all the rituals of the coronation ceremony are a counterpart of those used in Old Testament days. I will now present a short study of coronation ceremonies of the monarchs of Britain, who sat upon the world's greatest throne, and that someday will be occupied by our Lord Jesus Christ. Westminster Abbey in London has been the scene of the coronations of every king and queen of England since William the Conqueror. This painting shows the abbey as it may have looked in the 16th century. It has received many alterations and additions since. In the foreground, the River Thames flows under Westminster Bridge. Seen today in the center of this aerial view, the abbey is dwarfed by the House of Lords and the Parliament buildings. Westminster Abbey is a royal peculiar, meaning that it comes under the jurisdiction of a dean and a chapter who are appointed by the monarch, rather than by the Archbishop of Canterbury or the Bishop of London. The interior of the Abbey is magnificent. Its chapels and aisles are filled with monuments and memorials, and contains the tombs of most of Britain's rulers up to the 18th century. This is the choir. Like the rest of the abbey, its roof is decorated with elaborate traceries and bosses. The west front of the abbey is the entrance through which all important processions enter. Over the doorway is the famous Gothic stained glass window, known as the Israel window. Portraying across the top 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Below the patriarchs are the twelve sons of Jacob, whose descendants were to be as the dust of the earth and the sand on the shores, who would spread across to the west, to the east, to the south, and the north. In St. Edward's Chapel reposes the supreme symbol of sovereignty, the primeval monument that binds together the English-speaking people, the coronation stone, traditionally known as Jacob's royal stone of destiny, resting under the coronation chair. Over this stone, all the Irish, Scottish, and English monarchs, with one exception, have been crowned. Today, the stone is missing under the chair, it having been returned to Scotland, where it can be seen today in Edinburgh Castle, with the other honors of Scotland. It will be returned to Westminster Abbey for all future coronations. The form, style, and composition of the coronation's opening procession to the Abbey has changed significantly over the centuries. This painting illustrates a procession of Richard I on September the 3rd, 1184. Two bishops under the canopy support the monarch to the church. As the queen enters the great west door of Westminster Abbey, they are met by the civil and ecclesiastical dignitaries who, bearing the regalia, escort them up the nave, led by the choristers who sing the anthem, taken from the 122nd Psalm composed by King David. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is at unity with itself. The preparation for the coronation commences with a litany that contains a prayer. O God, we have heard with our ears, and our fathers have declared unto us the noble works that thou didst in their days and in old times before them. At the east side of the abbey, and afterwards at the south, west, and north sides, the monarch is presented to the people, the Archbishop of Canterbury, saying, Sirs, I here present to you your undoubted king. Wherefore, all you who are come this day to do homage and service, are you willing to do the same? The people signify their assent by acclamation and cries of, God save the king. We find in 1 Samuel 10, verse 24, these words. And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. The coronation sermon is delivered either by the Archbishop of Canterbury or the Dean of the Abbey. The preaching of such a sermon absolutely originated in Israel of old. There are numerous examples of such in the Old Testament, where the prophet or the priest addressed the king and the people at the coronations. It is very significant that at the coronation of George III, Bishop Drummond addressed the king with these words, taken from 1 Kings 10, verse 9. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighteth in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel, because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore made he thee king to do judgment and justice. Following the sermon, the king or queen expresses their free will by taking the oath and promises to uphold justice in the kingdom. He or she then goes to the altar and places their right hand on the Bible, that is God's book of the law, and makes a solemn oath, saying, The things which I have promised, I will perform and keep, so help me, God. After kissing the Bible, the monarch reads aloud the following statement. I do solemnly and sincerely, in the presence of God, profess, testify, and declare that I am a faithful member of the Protestant Reformed Church, by law established in England, and I will, according to the true enactments which secure Protestant succession to the throne of my realm, uphold and maintain the said enactments to the best of my powers, according to law. It is significant that in 2 Kings 11, verse 17, are these words. And Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord and the king and the people, that they should be the Lord's people. Next in the coronation ceremony is the anointing with oil. 
Anointing with oil was an act which God ordained long ago as an outward sign of divine election into an office or special service. In Exodus, God commanded Moses to anoint Aaron, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. In like manner, as a monarch is seated on the coronation chair over the stone of destiny, the Archbishop of Canterbury reads the following prayer at Queen Elizabeth II's coronation in 1953. O Lord, who by anointing with oil didst of old make and consecrate kings, priests, and prophets to teach and govern thy people Israel, bless and sanctify thy chosen servant who by our office and ministry is now to be anointed with this oil and consecrated queen of this realm. Strengthen her, O Lord, with the Holy Ghost and comfort her. Following the anthem comes the most sacred moment of the whole coronation ceremony symbolizing God's choice of the sovereign of the realm to sit upon David's throne. The archbishop takes the golden spoon into which the dean of the abbey has poured some oil, the ampulla or golden dove, and with the oil from the spoon, the archbishop anoints the monarch's head, breast and hands, three times, as he says, Be thy head anointed with holy oil. Be thy breast anointed with holy oil. Be thy hands anointed with holy oil. And as Solomon was anointed by Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet, so be you anointed, blessed and consecrated ruler over this people, whom the Lord hath given you to rule and govern, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Bath Abbey is this stained glass window depicting King Edgar in 973, being crowned after being anointed at his coronation. After the anointing of the monarch, there follows the delivery of the royal regalia, the royal crowns, the orb, the golden spoon, the rods and swords, the ring and the bracelet. Then follows the girding of the swords with the appointed sword of spiritual justice or sword of state and the curatana or unpointed sword of mercy. These are placed on the altar to signify the monarch's intent under God to rule in justice, equity, and mercy. The sword also symbolizes the monarch's authority and his role as a leader in war. However, the two symbolic functions attached to the sword in the English coronation ritual are the defense of the church and the defense of the kingdom into the care of the king. Of all the swords that play a part in the coronation ritual, the most important one is a jeweled sword of state. The present sword was made in 1678 and has been used at the coronations of all monarchs from King George IV onward and possibly from as early as that of James II. The introduction of spurs into the English coronation ceremony is believed inspired by the ritual of making a knight, which includes buckling of spurs to the heel. The golden spurs of St. George made about 1661 were once buckled on, but now they are only touched to the sovereign's heel before being placed on the altar. The next event in the coronation ceremony is the investiture of the monarch with the robe, which is also an ancient Hebrew custom. It formed part of the coronations of David's throne in 582 BC, but its first appearance was in the wilderness of Sinai after the Exodus, where the robe was one of the important garments put upon Aaron and he was anointed as high priest for Israel. In more modern times, three imperial robes are used for coronations and state affairs. This is the crimson robe of state with a cap of maintenance. The robe of purple velvet, here showing the scepter and the orb and the imperial state crown. The golden imperial mantle, here showing the scepter and the rod and St. Edward's gold crown. Behind the monarch is the coronation chair. Here we see Edward II being crowned on the coronation chair at Westminster Abbey in 1902. This painting illustrates the three coronation robes worn by King George at his coronation ceremony in Westminster Abbey in 1911. The purple robe, the golden imperial mantle, the crimson robe. George was known as the Sailor King, having spent most of his adult career in the Navy. 
It was said at his coronation, seldom has a country been blessed with sovereigns who are in such sympathy with the poor as our new monarch and his consort, Queen Mary. Here he is as a midshipman aboard the Britannia. In the Grand Accession Council, with which his reign began, George paid a touching tribute to Her Majesty Queen Mary. I am encouraged by the knowledge that I have in my dear wife, one who will be a constant helpmate in every endeavor for our people's good. This painting by Albert Collins shows King George VI wearing the purple velvet robe and holding the scepter with the crown. On the table is a coronation crown with the orb. At the same time the monarch receives the robe, he or she is given the orb, a golden sphere six inches in diameter surmounted by a cross. The symbolism of the orb, the globe of the world, dominated by the emblem of Christianity, is emphasized by the archbishop when he puts it in that monarch's hand at the investiture of the royal mantle but it is then handed back so as to leave both monarch's hands free to receive the ring and two scepters. The archbishop then says to the monarch, Receive this imperial robe and orb and the Lord endure you with majesty and with power from on high. The Lord clothe you with the robe of righteousness and with the garment of salvation. And when you see this orb set under the cross, Remember that the whole world is subject to the power and empire of Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, so that no man can reign happily who derives not his authority from him and directs not all his action according to his laws. Three coronation rings are used in the coronation. The ring signifies the union of the monarch with the people, that is the marriage to the nation. The symbolism of the ring has a biblical parallel. According to the biblical record, the Lord Jehovah was married to the nation of Israel. Reading from Jeremiah 3, verse 14. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. This 18th century mystical painting shows a Scottish king receiving a ring on his way to his coronation. The sovereign's ring was made for William IV. In its center is a large sapphire with a diamond surround. Over this are laid five rubies representing the cross of St. George. The Queen Consort's ring was made for Queen Adelaide, the wife of William IV in 1831. Queen Victoria's ring was especially made for her because her tiny fingers could not retain the larger coronation ring. Engraved within the shank are the words Queen Victoria's Coronation Ring, 1838. It was made for Victoria's little finger, but the Archbishop forced it on the traditional fourth finger, and it is reported that it caused her much difficulty and pain in removing it, which is probably why Her Majesty is looking a mite sour. The next step in the coronation is the presentation of the two rods to the monarch. Both rods have a small orb of the world, surmounting them at the top. One is mounted with a cross above the orb and is called the scepter, which is held in the monarch's right hand. It contains a magnificent diamond, the Star of Africa. The other is mounted with a dove and is simply called the rod. The dove, symbolic of the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, is held in the monarch's left hand. Zechariah 6, verse 12 and 13 prophesies of Christ. Behold the man whose name is the branch. He shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne. A minor but very significant part of the coronation ceremony is the presentation of the bracelets to the monarch. There is a biblical precedence for the use of bracelets in the inauguration of a monarch. David has brought the bracelets and diadem worn by Saul after Saul's death. Apparently, they were not always used in English coronations. After having been invested with the emblems and insignias of royal dignity, the monarch is presented with the coronation crown of England, known today as St. Edward's crown, because it is a copy of the one used by Edward the Confessor, founder of Westminster Abbey.
The crown is the chief symbol of royal power. Precise detail of crowns worn by English kings before the later medieval and renaissance periods are very sparse. St. Edward's crown is of pure gold. Its rim is set with 12 large stones of various colors, each surrounded by diamonds. The number and coloring of the stones are most significant. They are identical with those which God commanded Israel's high priest to wear throughout the history of Israel as a kingdom nation. Reading from Exodus 28, verse 21. And the stone shall be with the number of the children of Israel, twelve, according to their names, like the engravings of a signet. Everyone with his name shall they be according to the twelve tribes. The imperial state crown is used on various state occasions. In the center face is a black Prince Edward III's ruby set in the middle of the cross. Beneath it is the famous second star of Africa, cut in the Cullinan diamond. When the royal crown is placed upon the monarch's head, the archbishop gives a final benediction, praying to God, saying, O God, who crownest thy faithful servant with mercy and loving kindness, look down upon this thy servant, our sovereign, who now in lowly devotion bowest her head to thy divine majesty, and as thou dost this day set a crown of pure gold upon her head, so enrich her royal heart with thy heavenly grace, adorn the high station wherein thou hast placed her through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be honor and glory forever. A final act of the coronation is a homage paid to the new sovereign by the people, as seen in this painting of King George VI receiving homage. This is no modern ceremony as we have seen, for in the days of the first king chosen to reign over God's kingdom race is of old. We read in 1 Samuel 10 verse 24, and Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. The symbols of sovereignty, the crowns, scepters, swords, spurs, bracelets, rings, spoon, and pulla, or golden dove, the coronation itself is rooted in the Old Testament history. All are visible evidences of God's promise to King David that his throne would endure forever, as we find recorded in Psalms 89, verse 3 and 4. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant, thy seed will I establish forever, and build up thy throne to all generations.